Well, this is Broadcasting History Interview, which we're doing on uh, July 16th of 2006 uh, out here at beautiful Rotary Reserve where we're holding the Blackhawk Employees Reunion. And my guest for this conversation is Pam Hildebrand Grimes, uh, who was a Blackhawk employee back in the 1970s, 80s, uh, but currently uh, is a producer for WGN Television in, uh, in Big Chicago. So, Pam, uh, tell us about what you're doing these days. <clears throat> I am a special projects producer, which basically means I do mostly features, they call them cover stories, mm. that air on WGN News at 9, on the 9 p.m. news. And we have the luxury of an hour newscast, so we can take more time than a lot of stations are able to give to these kind of stories. But I've done um, so many different things. It's just been amazing. A year ago at this time, I was in Alaska with our weatherman who has a world-renowned reputation, Tom Skilling. Um, we went up to do a tsunami special, and we did an hour documentary on tsunamis on American shores, which aired in December in conjunction with the one-year anniversary of the Asian tsunami, which was in 2004. And then um, when the White Sox went to the World Series last year, I got to go. So I was on the field when the White Sox won the World Series, and I um, had my picture taken with the owner and the trophy. And, and when Coretta Scott King died in um, March, I was able to go to Atlanta for her funeral. And so I've done a, a very broad range of uh, features and semi-hard news stories and no investigative stuff, but more, more I'd say, light side. And what is side. the third largest, uh, third largest market, television in, market in the, co in the right. world? In the world, exactly. <coughs> Well, that's kind of, so let's stop the tape there for a second. Okay. Uh, well, I guess you still, still can do that right. in the digital world. Yes. Uh, and uh, let's roll it back to uh, <coughs> 19, 1970. Can you put a year on it? 1970, I was graduating from high school hmm. and uh, got my job at KCRG, got my first break in news as a newsroom secretary at KCRG in Cedar Rapids, my hometown. And at the time, um, I was in the newsroom um, the very first day that I went to apply for the job. Hmm. Um, I was there maybe an hour and a half, and the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision came down, and President Johnson died. And there was so much chaos and energy in that newsroom that I thought, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this job, <laughs> because this is the kind of energy that I need to be around. And so that, I kind of saw it as a sign, I guess, that, that this is where I needed to be, so. So you started in news as the newsroom secretary yes. at KCRG, in, uh, primarily in the radio, on the radio right. side then. <coughs> and that, <coughs> that uh, at the time that, uh, that you did that, there were <coughs> virtually no women on the air. We, right. we had this maxim that one of the maxims of radio is that women don't do news, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were, no, there were no other women there at the time that I started. Uh, the news director basically liked my voice and said, um, would you mind doing some radio headlines on the weekend? It was basically a dumping ground, I think, on a <laughs> Sunday morning. There was a polka program, <laughs> so it meant rolling out of bed really early <laughs> on a Sunday. and. <laughs> coming in to rip and read some news, basically. And um, so that, that was my first job in news. And you were doing that when, uh, <clears throat> whether we approached you or you approached us. Uh, but anyway, uh, you set up an interview. And, uh, and <clears throat> I guess, uh, and I was at that time was the news director at uh, Channel 7, right. the NBC affiliate in Waterloo. And uh, we hired you uh, to do radio. <clears throat> right. The connection was a photographer. There were, you know, a lot of the photographers would go to the same news events, and uh -huh. one of the photographers at KCRG knew one of the photographers at KWWL, and so um, he knew that I really was looking for something different, and um, <coughs> so he said, "Well, let me see." And I think there's a radio job, and so then, you know, that was when you gave me an opportunity <coughs> to come in and talk to you about it. But I just make the point here that <coughs> just. We started out with what you're doing. <clears throat> you're doing television producing in the third largest market in the country now. Right. And when you broke into radio, you and a woman named Kathy Spielman right. were the really the first women's voices that were on radio and television in Waterloo. Kathy Spielman was there shortly before I was there. She was a reporter, television reporter, and an anchor woman. Right. She was anchoring the news show. 
she was maybe three years older than I was, but I totally admired her work. I <coughs> would watch every minute of KWWL because I thought she is so good. <coughs> and so I really, and I actually came across, I met her at a news event in Cedar Rapids when I was at KCRG. For some reason I was in the field mm -hmm. and she came to a news event and I, I think I paid no attention at all to whatever <laughs> the news event was because I was so enamored <coughs> that Kathy Spielman was there. And then I was hired to do radio. So there was never, you know, we weren't really competing because she was on the television right. side <coughs> and I was on the radio <coughs> side and so there was... But I was we, glad to have her there, I can tell you that. But we did radio and television out of the same newsroom. Exactly. <clears throat> and Kathy had the, uh, her breakthrough was actually at our Sioux City station, KTIV. That's right, I forgot about she that. Had, uh, she had right. anchored over there. Right. But she was the first woman to anchor television right. in, uh, in, uh, in the Waterloo Cedar Rapids market. Maybe even, in, was anybody, in, or were there any women in Des Moines? I don't <coughs> remember any women in Des Moines. I think she may have been the first in <coughs> Iowa. The first woman anchor in Iowa, as near as I've been able to determine it, <coughs> Uh, was uh, was at Mason City, oh. and uh, she uh, uh, she is now the uh, m uh, vice president of marketing at Iowa State University. Oh, really? But she was the first. Well, she would have been the first one to anchor in the evening newscast, oh, gotcha. right? Gotcha. So, <clears throat> uh, so you uh, you looked across the desk and you thought. That television thing is, <laughs> radio's okay, but I'd like to do more. <clears throat> yeah, I really, I really love television. I love the whole picture <clears throat> process. I love the, you know, the fact that there was just another layer of information for people. And, you know, there were so many stories that the picture really told the story. If you didn't say a thing, the pictures were so powerful that <clears throat> I just thought, and, and even to this day, I think I let the pictures tell the story. I try to not write much. I try to just let the story unfold and I think people do a better job of telling their own stories than I could ever tell. The video always dominates and the better you do with it the, the more compelling it is. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And that's of course is precisely uh, I s what you just said is an uh, obviously a key to your success as a television producer. I think so. People like <coughs> you early on um, told me how to write to pictures. They taught me how to write to pictures. So. You know, it wasn't, you know, when we all started in the early days, there, <coughs> there, it was kind of like there were a lot of radio-TV combinations. So people yeah. did work their way from radio to television. Right. But television is not radio with pictures. <laughs> it's a whole different deal. Right. And so you really have to know how to make the most of your pictures and how to, you can't say one thing and show something else because right. you can't really. It conflicts that. It conflicts and, and it confuses people. Right. And, and, you know, again, it's only a one <coughs> shot. You've got one shot hmm. to let people really understand and communicate what it is you're trying to tell them. So uh, help me now remember how we, we got you across the bridge to full-time television. Well, what really happened, we added a 5 o'clock news. Oh, okay. And so um, there were new opportunities. But also, you were encouraging me at that point to go to college. Mm -hmm. And with Cedar Falls, you and I right there, um, it really worked out. There, there weren't many night class offerings. So it really worked out well for me to be able to go to school full time during the day and then work as a reporter at night. And, and that worked for radio and it worked for television for a while. Um, so, so that's kind of how that worked was a little bit of just worked for everybody's schedule right. too. So. And you started then as uh, what we, <coughs> I'm sure that I insisted that you learn how to shoot because we all shot. Well, I tried, although <laughs> I think I was one of the few who <laughs> somehow managed to skirt that, <laughs> that law, <laughs> the grant law. <laughs> I did learn to shoot a little bit, Rudimentary. and I and I'm I love photography. I love <laughs> I drag a camera with me everywhere. I have still photos <laughs> back to 1975 from you know my broadcasting days, and I totally appreciate videography. Um, you know the the people who <laughs> are shooters, uh, I have nothing but admiration for. But you would go, you'd be in television, you were the field reporter, and we usually supported yes. you with the photographer exactly. then. Exactly, exactly. And started doing uh, producing individual stories then, which is where you sort of got your first opportunity right. of how you do, of how you blend video into storytelling. Exactly, storytelling, exactly. So that went on. You know, I was at KWWL almost 10 years, just a few months shy of 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though, you know, I was called a lifer and, you oh. know, people would kid me about being there forever, you know, <coughs> when you start at 20 years old and you leave at 30 years old, right. <coughs> and I never really felt like I had the same job for more than a year mm -hmm. because I, you know, I started in radio and then I 
worked my way into television, and then I anchored and produced. And then the last year I was there, I produced the 6 and 10 o'clock news. So I had yeah. just such a wealth of experience there in all different aspects okay. of right. writing and producing and even some assignment desk work. And I had a regular beat. You know, I had the education beat for a while. I had the city council beat for a while. I had the police beat. The mayor's beat. You know, mm. I had a lot of different experience there. Well, I don't know. I, I suspect you do remember this because it's probably one of your horrible recollections. <laughs> <laughs> you and I shared the assignment <laughs> desk for a couple Sometimes of years. Sometimes we or, did. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. When during the after we <clears throat> made the tra after the Blackhawk uh, stations were sold, <clears throat> uh, w we were back to a television-only operation. Right. right. And so, in order to stretch that staff. Uh, we, uh, you were the uh, assignment editor in the afternoon, right. and I was the assignment editor in the morning. Right, exactly. And we shared that responsibility. We did. We did. At that time, you were, uh, uh, you were anchoring the new newscast. That right. was your primary assignment. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that really worked out, though, because I would get off the air, yeah. and then at that point, you kind of moved over. You came in very early. I and went then back in my office in true, the corner where true. I was True. Well, yeah, you did. Well, you did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your other job. Yeah. And then I would but do that. But you set up the assignments for the next day. That's you saw true. them through in the afternoon. And I did do some beat checks. I would run over to City Hall sure, and you know run by I'm the sure. mayor's office and that right. sort of thing, and just kind of see what was going on over and there. And again. That is one of the great differences between what we did in those days and what goes on now right. is you are out there, you actually had sources, right. and you knew what Very was going true. on in that community. <clears throat> and I think that's a real loss for everyone because, you know, you can't, unless you've been someplace, you know, Chicago's kind of a different deal because it is kind of a lifer situation. When you right. reach the third largest market, people aren't really going anywhere. They put down roots, they buy homes, they have kids, yeah. you know. They, they are there for good. And so, you know, because of that longevity, you do get some of that sources. People call you with stories and that sort of thing for people who have been there a long time. But there is no education reporter. You know, mm -hmm. some of the, the O and O's, the owned and operated stations in Chicago, do have, like, political reporters. Yeah. And, you know, they have feature reporters. And they're specialized. They have medical reporters. But they don't really have beat reporters like we used to have. Right. And, of course, what's missing without the beat reporters is you're losing you're losing uh, con the n news contact with the, with the political power structure right. in the community, in the state, and at the national level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it is a shame that, that beats have gone away yeah. because I, I think it is, um, it, it, you provide less content, you provide less context mm. for, for what's happening. Um, so I think you know, viewers suffer because of that. What's your uh, one of the stories that I remember you covering uh, was an enormously uh, compelling uh, spot story. Remember the pipeline explosion? Oh sure, <laughs> sure, out in the cornfield. Why don't you remember? Oh my gosh, that story was it was so bitterly cold. I really have no idea, but it had to be well below zero because it was one of those experiences where your face doesn't work, your mouth doesn't <laughs> open, your hands you can't write because everything is your fingers are frozen and of course I was never dressed the way I should be dressed of course I didn't have any North Face or you know Eddie Bowery <laughs> gear at that point you know I was out there probably in high heels and I'm nylons sure or whatever because you when the story broke you went you had to hmm. and so I remember you know being out in this bitterly bitterly cold cornfield you know as the sun was going down climbing up on the roof of this live van so that you could see there was must have been a little bit of a rise there or something the only way you could really see what was happening even though it was a big plume of fire was to be on top of the van and so obviously the shooter was up there too with me and it was amazing I mean you know we were you get out there you start talking you know you don't really have a whole lot of information but <clears throat> well this was an excavation in which yes. they hit a major uh, natural gas pipeline exactly. what was I think there were with a couple of fatalities? Yes, it was a tiling operation. Tiling I don't remember operation. exactly, but yeah. they were trying to lay some, you know, tile underneath these fields for drainage purposes yeah. and then, you know, cut right through one of these lines and it immediately exploded. And I think there may have been as many as four killed. I, I think I, so. I yeah. can't remember. That there and was, that there fire was a great loss of life. It did. Yeah. It took a long time to get that gas turned off. That yeah. must have been a major, yeah. major line. It was, yeah. But but I just remember it just being so, the conditions <laughs> On top were of that so day. awful. So we were doing so live at that point. We were doing live shots at that yeah. point, yeah. Yeah. Well, 
it, the, it, doing news and has never has never been always no. been easy. <laughs> the glamorous life of a reporter, you know. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, right. And it wasn't a question of should we send a man or a woman on this. Do we send a reporter? Exactly. We sent a reporter, and, and it was yeah. you. And yeah. you went out and did it. <laughs> Absolutely. So. I thrived on that kind of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. But the one, my one regret in Waterloo is at 10 years of chasing tornadoes, and I never saw one. Yeah. You know, we'd always get there after yeah. the fact when yeah. the car was in the basement and yeah. the house was gone, but we never, <laughs> I never, ever saw a tornado Didn't on get to see it never coming. Never got to yeah. see one. No. Still haven't seen one. Well, well, you and I were just uh, recalling with your, your uh, compadre, uh, Laurie Fagan, uh, the, the T-Bone Taylor story, right. which is... Right. Again, that was this uh, cop killing t two sure. uh, uh, two officers killed in the shootout, right. and that was a very, very intense experience sure for was. all of us. For all of us, I remember being again. It was the other extreme of Iowa weather, which was a day pretty much like today, where yeah. it was blisteringly hot, and yeah. we're standing out in a cornfield, and there were bugs, and it was miserable, and no shade, and no sunscreen, and no water, <laughs> and so. You know, and the, and basically they were combing these cornfields looking for this man who exactly. was on the loose, and and I who had my, just killed two policemen. Absolutely, and mm. I remember going to a news conference under those conditions, and of course everybody's nerves are on edge oh, because yeah. you know two friends had been killed. You know, everyone who was looking for this killer had been friends with these people, and yeah. so you know they their emotions were raw, <laughs> our emotions were raw, and and I remember asking a question. I think I asked. Do you expect um, to find to take T-Bone Taylor alive? Mm -hmm. And I remember the police chief at the time was so outraged <laughs> that I would dare ask a question like that because, you know, it, I guess he assumed that I figured it was vigilante justice. You uh -huh. know, the minute you find him, you shoot him, and you know, as long as you get him, it doesn't yeah. really matter how you get him, as long as you get him. Yeah. And that really wasn't what I meant at all. Yeah. I just thought, between the heat and you know, the fact that. You know, he could pop up right in your face. Exactly. You know, when you're when everybody's got their guns out and mm. running through the cornfields, I figure anything could happen. So and anything could I, have. It absolutely could. As it happen. was, right. it, he was arrested without that happening. In, right. in a home, mm. I think, wasn't he discovered in someone's home or? Well, he was. He had hidden out in an, in a ma in a barn. A barn. Yeah. And uh, and you know they were hunting for you know that under the assumption that he didn't, um, but they didn't know that he hadn't right. left the area, right. and he surfaced, it was down at LaPorte City. That's right, that's, right. that's where I was, that was I we had a live truck down there he, too. Yeah. And then he was tried on a change of venue in Council Bluffs, and Laurie was, did the story oh, from Council Bluffs right. using uh, it, what it amounted to, it was an early version of a satellite delivery of, of an ongoing story from right. a remote location. Right. that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right. So we all had a hand in that story. I guess. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, <clears throat> you <clears throat> so the uh, sort of the to go back to uh, you uh, you wound up producing for you had right. been our new you always produced the new. I mean, you, you evolved into producing when you anchored the new news. Right. Right. And then the last year you produced the the six and ten. Mm -hmm. Right. And I really wanted to do that because. I think uh, your dislike, hmm. may I say, of consultants kind of rubbed off on me because I really didn't like these people that I really didn't know who they were or what they were about or what their qualifications were, hmm. trying to tell us how to do news in Iowa. I thought yeah. these are people from Texas and I don't even remember where they came yeah. from, but I thought what do they know about television news in Waterloo, Iowa? Yeah. So. I guess it got to the point where I had had enough of your hair's too light, your hair's too long, your mm. clothes are too loud, your mm. blah, blah, blah. And mm. I just thought, you know what? They are not listening to what I'm saying <laughs> at all. Right. So I thought, I want to be in a position to be able to, to call the shots. And so I thought going behind the scenes and producing some newscasts would afford me that opportunity. And I'm so grateful that I did that. Not that I've ever really um, reached a news director position or a, or a position of authority where I really, but but I do feel like I've had such a hand in Many news operations at this time that I that there have been times when I could really step up and say, I don't think we really wanted to cover that story, or this is why don't we let's do this yeah. this way. Well, the producer is is um, is the person that's molding the sixty or the what's now down to maybe eleven minutes right. that actually news that actually right. maybe it's less than that content right. and it was getting less and less as time went by. Exactly. <clears throat> so you're right. But you made a tremendous move then when you were able to move from, we would have been about the 80th market in Iowa then to, right. uh, to, to 
20s, Phoenix. I think 20 something. I forget what it was exactly yeah. when I moved to Phoenix, but I was hired as the um, 10 o'clock producer at the, sta the ABC station in Phoenix, which turned out to be an unbelievable opportunity. Um, the news director who hired me didn't last much longer after I, after I got there. And um, so that was an interesting, you know, there was a news management change. They basically mm. went across town, hired all of the news managers from the number one station across town, brought them over, and put them in charge of our place. And these were somewhat renegade news people. These were people who, um, they had the first satellite truck, certainly in Phoenix, maybe mm. one of the first satellite trucks in the country. And mm. this was in 1984, I believe. And they were doing this thing in the summertime. You know, summertime in Arizona is not a fun place. So I think basically it was an opportunity to get out of the desert heat. But they would take the satellite truck on the road and do yeah. this basically newscast on the road. It was more of a travelogue than anything. Yeah. But they'd drive it up to the Grand Canyon and they'd drive it to Lake Havasu. And they'd, you know, it was basically showing off the state of sure. Arizona. And right. but, but logistically, I mean, trying to put a live broadcast on and to go into places, remote areas like the Grand Canyon, where there are no computer, there are no even typewriters. Right. You know, you all, if you have a phone line, they were trying to plug it in and do a live broadcast. Mm -hmm. So you basically were producing two shows, one for live if it worked, mm -hmm. and a backup uh, in studio if it didn't work. Yeah. So, I mean, these people were crazy. But, mm -hmm. I mean, we really, in terms of live television, I learned so much oh. there. and. And they had a real knack for finding talent. They, um, Elizabeth Vargas from ABC News really? came out of that station. And Darren Kagan, who's one of the main anchors on CNN, came out of that station. Jody mm. Applegate, who mm. was at the Today Show for many years. She, all of these people, you know, came out of this one station. Mm -hmm. and, and it was because they just had a real knack for finding talent and making the most of it. Right. So, yeah, it was an amazing time. Well, it was. I was there about six years. But, again, it's uh, the... It was those of us who have been in it all our lives, you, you, uh, you, pr you get as far as you can within a station, and then you have. If you're going to do better, you've got to get to a bigger you've market. You've got to move on. Well, exactly. a bigger market is Des Moines or maybe Kansas City, but to go from the 80th market right. to 24, or 23, or whatever right. it was, pretty unusual right. in those that days. That was pretty unusual. In fact, I had tried to get a job hmm. at like a 40 size market. Hmm. I had looked at. Milwaukee and maybe Nashville, mm. Louisville, those kind of markets, and and really wasn't having any luck. Mm. And then I found out later when I got to Phoenix, you know, so much of it is timing and so much of it is luck. But there actually was the I think the executive producer at the time um, was a guy who had a bone to pick with somebody at Blackhawk, and oh. I don't remember who it was exactly. Okay. But it was somebody who was like, "Here's a longtime employee. Yeah. I'm going to stick it to him oh. by hiring this person away." <laughs> so I don't think it was so much. I'd love to say it was my credentials <laughs> and my charm, but. Hmm. But I really think they were trying to trying to. Um, well, I think it had something to do with the fact we were doing pretty good television there for yes, its time. Yes, we were. Yes, we and, were. And uh, you that he wouldn't have been able to stick it to us if you That's hadn't true. been holding it. I had a very a solid position. tape. I have to say, right. a very <laughs> solid. Tape. Yeah, right. Well, it, it's uh, so. Then you made the well. Let me say, uh, you uh, you left to Waterloo with. Uh, do you need to change batteries? Sure. Oh. Um, well, I wanted to inject the Bill's name in it. Uh, you, you, okay, so we'll do that. <clears throat> so you are you you're uh, in Chicago now. You are Mrs. Grimes, and yep. that is Bill Grimes, who right. is uh, uh, did at one time anchor the uh, the late news on right. uh, on the weekends in right. cha Channel Seven. Mm -hmm. But Bill has gotten out of the business completely, and what's he yes. doing? He is a trial consultant. Hmm. Is his official title. Um, he works for a company that does a lot of media training. Hmm. They do um, test cases for major corporations. Um, they do some mock juries, hmm. a lot of focus groups to try to see. You know, a lot of companies are wondering, is it worth me going to trial, or right. should I just go ahead and settle this case? He helps pick juries. Um, a, lo a lot, very, a lot of media-related stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of, lot of skills that he learned in news. Sure. Um, he's good at interviewing. He's good at questions, how to pose questions to get the most out of potential jurors, yeah. and all of those things came directly from news, so it was, it was easily transferable. Was it think. transferable skill? I think a lot of them, a lot of the skills were. Even consultants, you know, how yeah. people look. Oh, you know, well, if, of course. If you have a key, w a star witness in a case, and hmm. they can't look someone in the eye, or yeah. they're fidgeting with their face, or, you know, 
they just look like they haven't slept in two months, they look guilty, or, you know, all of those things, they, they're very superficial, but yeah. at the same time, yeah. people can read into all of that body language. They, they think, oh boy, he, just, he looks kind of shifty, or he, he looks kind of guilty, or, right. you know, so there's a lot of, um, mm. a lot of those cosmetic things really play into how, how you translate. Well, and uh, <coughs> so your decision to go from Phoenix to Chicago was a family decision? It really was. Bill, mm. Bill got the job um, in Chicago. You know, he, that was always his goal, as mm. you know, even mm. when he was in Waterloo, mm. it was always his goal to get back to Chicago, his hometown. Mm. So when he had this opportunity to move um, to Chicago, he had followed me to Arizona, so yeah. it was really my turn. You turned the tables. It was my turn to follow him. Yeah. So. Fortunately, again, the KWWL connection, Tom Peterson, who was at WGN Radio, yeah. um, said, you know, let me put in a good word to the, you know, assistant news director. I know the assistant news director very well. Yeah. And it happened to be at a time when they were expanding the 9 p.m. news from a half hour to an hour. So mm -hmm. they, they had writers, um, four openings for writers on the mm -hmm. 9 o'clock news. So that was my foot in the door and then kind of took it from there. Right. And the Grimes have a family now? We, mm. have, we have two teenagers at the <laughs> moment. We have a son who is uh, going to be a senior in high school, <laughs> um, wants to be a pilot. And we have a daughter who's 13, will be in eighth grade this uh -huh. year. So they're great kids. Oh, great, I'll bet great they kids. are. So <laughs> they got to be. They're really wonderful <laughs> kids. So, and they're doing well in school. And, <laughs> you know, knock on wood, <laughs> things will continue to go well. Life goes on. Life and goes on. And sure that's, uh, yeah. yeah, well, again, uh, it's... It's been a, quite a ride for, as we has. knew you, Pam Hildebrand, hasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I just am amazed every day. You know, I really, really, truly love what I'm doing. And, you know, there have been a few awards along the way that I'm very proud Once, of. And, yeah. and um, you know, I have three Emmys, which, you know, I would Only never... Only three Emmys I, now, I Pam. We thought we expected <laughs> more of you. Well, <laughs> I, ha I have uh, hmm. 26 nominations, I believe. <laughs> So that counts, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I won a Peter Lissagor this year, which is a Society of Professional Journalists headline. It's oh. a Chicago Headline Club Award. Right. So that was, that was a really big deal. Well, I was very excited about that. So I'm, I'm certainly doesn't surprise me. So it's just been a great run. It's just been a great. I never, you know, so much of it is timing. So much of it is, you know. Mm -hmm being at the right place at the right time. And, uh, well, you know, I know you want to be, don't want to be known as the old pioneer. <laughs> I, I don't mind but at all, you truly. Were a pioneer. You were, you know, it's, it's always, as I look back on, you know, in 40-some years in broadcasting right. and 16 after that, sure. uh, that we were stupid enough to think that women couldn't be <laughs> co-equals with men in this field of communication, for right. God's sake. <laughs> Well, just, you know, that wasn't just broadcasting. I mean, I always felt like broadcasting, you know, there were a lot of feminist men in broadcasting because yeah. I never, ever felt like I was um, not an equal partner in what we were trying to accomplish. I'm glad you felt that way. I always, there was not one person at KWWL that ever made me feel like, you know, I was I was a trailblazer, or I, you know, I was just a token. You know, re oh, we had to hire a woman, so let's, you know, let's throw a blonde. At and this. you know, I would hope that, and and the decisions that I, you know, I was I had, uh, you know, we came across that wall at Channel Two. I had hired the first woman staff member down there mm -hmm. before I made the change, and and uh, by that time I hoped that my I had become enlightened enough to say. This ain't because she's a woman, it's right. because she's qualified. Right. And of right. course, you know my Ben, she was absolutely qualified right. to be a reporter. Right. But <laughs> she may not have been qualified in, in some of the consultants' uh, right. Uh, categories. Right. right. Exactly. And of course, that was a great handicap to her. I uh, never felt like I was, I felt like there was nothing but opportunity after opportunity at KWWL. I mean, it just, they hmm. so totally opened every door for me. There was not, part of it was we, we were non-union, so there were no yeah. restrictions on, hmm. you know, you can do this, and if you want to do that, okay, and if you hmm. want to do that, that's good too. And, you know, now in the third largest market where we are so heavily, hmm. and Chicago's oh, a very yeah, big right. union town, I mean, you, you don't cross any line, you don't pick up a camera, you don't touch hmm. an editor, you know, you don't. You pretty much, you know, hmm. when you're producing, you write and you, you know, let someone else. Well, let me tell you, Pam, I won't hold it against you <laughs> that you didn't really want to do photography. If you want to do the next interview, I'm sure Jimmy would stand aside. <laughs> I won't make won't you do that, you Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Pam, it's just been a delight to have oh, this conversation too, with Grant. you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank right. you. It's my pleasure. Yeah.
Uh, this is a broadcasting history interview which we're doing on July 16, 2006 with my friend and former colleague Gary Sarnoff and uh, we're going to talk about his career at Channel 7 and since and uh, kind of get to sort of recall old times, mm -hmm. Gary. Great to have you here. Oh, on, it's great to be uh, here. On this summer afternoon. Great, man. Out at Rotary Reserve, where we're mm -hmm. gathered for the Black Hawk Employees mm -hmm. Reunion. Your first visit here. It had, is. and it's Had a good time? <coughs> absolutely. This is what everything I'd hoped. A lot of seeing old friends, getting uh, names revisiting me from the past, yeah. and uh, the videos. It's, this is good stuff. Right. Well, you are <coughs> currently employed uh, in uh, Tucson, Arizona, television's producer down there. Uh, so Phoenix, actually. Phoenix, excuse yeah. me. Right. Okay. Close. I, I keep trying to move <laughs> you to Tucson. You don't want to go Tucson down there. Tucson, nice, but Phoenix, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you produce uh, for what station? <coughs> I produce for the ABC station, mm -hmm. KNXV, mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, I work uh, Thursday through Sunday. Thursday, I'm a field producer which uh, means I work nine to five mm. and basically go out and gather news, but I'm just not on the air. Right. And fr I produce the Friday 10 o'clock news, the Saturday 6 o'clock news, the Saturday 10 o'clock news, the Sunday 5.30 news, and I co-produce the Sunday 10 o'clock news. Okay, so you're the person who sits there and, and blends it all together, does a lot of the writing, the connecting uh, scripts, and, and uh, very key position in a pretty large market uh, station. What's, what's your number out there now? We are now, if I'm not, I think we're the 14th largest market now and going, that's the, we joke at the station, you don't have to move from Phoenix huh. and you keep moving to a larger market every yeah. year because the city's exploding. Exactly. So I think we're up to 14 now and, uh, and growing. And you're right, it's busy, even on the weekends, it's a big, big city, big market, and a lot of, a lot of news. A lot of news and uh, and a lot of emphasis on how it goes together, which is the key, the job that you have. Right, yeah, and I'm uh, sort of the weekend manager. We have an on-call manager, but I'm the person along with the assignment manager who figure out what stories we're going to cover. And you're right, what importance, what's going to be the lead, the all-important lead story, yeah. and then work on other stories to follow that. And uh, you're right, the flow of the show and doing a lot of the writing and just making sure we get through that half hour without anybody getting hurt. And very, very competitive has to be. <coughs> yeah, Phoenix is a very competitive market. We have uh, five television stations who are very competitive, including the Fox and the Independent, mm. which is a very competitive independent station down mm -hmm. there. They're owned by Below, and there's a lot of money, uh, the Independent and Fox. So it's it's one of those uh, markets where all five stations are are indeed very competitive. And <coughs> that puts a lot of pressure on that news department, doesn't it? It does. Mm. It's, uh, there's, it's constant pressure, and it's constant pressure to perform. And, uh, you know, you're always trying to get the ratings up, but more than anything, you're trying to get the coverage, trying to do the best job we can. That's what you're still interested in doing in the news department anyway. Exactly. <laughs> right. that's, the, that's the first priority. Mm. Hopefully the ratings will follow, but the main priority is try to inform the public as best we can using the technology that we have. Large staff. Large staff, not as big on the weekend, obviously, no. as in most markets, but mm. uh, large staff and lots of toys with a helicopter and a yeah. satellite truck at our disposal. And lots of live. <coughs> lots of live elements and expect at least two or three live reports every newscast. And we are luckily have the resources when there's big breaking news like wildfires mm. or... Which you've had a lot of. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we have a quick on-call system where we get that satellite truck or we have somebody come in in the helicopter and... Obviously, as a producer, you've got to be ready, and uh, that's another big difference down there is that there's a lot of breaking news yeah. that happens right before the newscast right. or during a newscast that <coughs> you've got to be ready to pounce on. Well, and again, that really puts a premium on on the producer you, because you're sitting in the, a really hot seat when you're changing yeah. that lineup as the newscast is flowing, right? That, that's why I don't have much hair anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay, it's well, a high stress explain. job. <laughs> <laughs> a very high stress job. It is. It's Probably the single, I don't know if it's the most high, but. It's going it, to be up there, at least for that hour or so around hour. newscast right. time. You know, obviously early in the day while you're gathering the news mm. and writing, there's not much stress. Because you've got one thing in your ear look, about what's going on with the satellite yep. truck. You've got another one with what's going out on the anchor desk. Exactly. And 
and you're trying to keep everybody happy, you're trying to uh, keep the anchors aware of what's going on and trying to communicate with the reporters who are about to be on the air mm -hmm. or our satellite people or the, the chopper pilot. And so you're right, there's a lot of buttons, a lot of things going on at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> Well, that's a long ways from the University of Minnesota <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the wonderful Twin Cities, uh, which is where you went to school and graduated, starting out with the right degree in journalism. <coughs> I went, uh, yeah, I actually started out in uh, hmm. the Institute of Technology, oh, of okay. all things. Hmm. And after about uh, two semesters of that, realized, yeah, it's hmm. just not me. And I was looking for something that I felt that I was naturally good at, and that would be fun, mm -hmm. and I saw broadcasting and broadcast journalism, and decided to give that a try and just fell in love with it. Uh -huh. just, uh, and I never had taken a journalism class in high school, but obviously took a lot of English <coughs> and writing classes and, and liked it, and yeah. speech. Mm -hmm. And I'd always done fairly well in speech, so I thought, maybe, uh, maybe this is better for me. And the rest, as they say, is history. The rest is history. <coughs> So you graduated from the U in what year then? 1973. 73. <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> uh, not very many people in television start out at the top. You actually <laughs> started out at the top in radio for, with WCCO right. FM in the right. Twin Cities. Yeah, I was lucky enough for mm. just shortly after I graduated mm. from college, uh, WCCO mm. had started the uh, FM station and they were looking for a large staff, and I had applied, mm. uh, hoping for the best, and uh, got at least a part-time job, which mm. I obviously was extended. I would have mm. loved a full-time job, but didn't expect that, but was happy to get a part-time job. And had worked there for almost a year, mm. part-time, hoping all the time that it would turn into a full-time mm. job, but didn't work out, got laid off, and uh, wound up finding full-time employment elsewhere. And that was in Iowa at a town called Clinton. <coughs> Clinton, Iowa, uh, KROS Radio. Keep right Historic on radio station in Iowa. Yeah, it was, it's been One there a the long time. One of the early ones. Yep. Right. And uh, especially compared to Minneapolis, a little river town, about yeah. 35,000. Yeah. But, but they did real news down there. Did real news. I, besides doing the news, I hosted two talk shows, mm -hmm. open mic talk shows. Okay and also an interview where I would bring somebody into the radio station. But yeah, they took news very seriously mm -hmm. at, at KROS. That station's reputation was built on connection to the community. Exactly. <coughs> so it was, good, it was a good full-time starting off point for right. me for the first full-time job. And, uh, <coughs> but you, uh, again, uh, uh, at that time you were in radio, you are looking, mm -hmm. most of us were looking at television. <laughs> and uh, you were looking for a television job. <coughs> I was, and I remember trying to find some TV stations that were fairly close to Clinton and you know, looking for Midwest small market, being reasonable about it, looking mm. for some smaller market TV stations. And uh, I remember s to the Eau Claire, Wisconsin's and uh, the Madison's and the Rockford, Illinois, mm -hmm. and Waterloo, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember sending out some resumes and uh, I was fortunate enough to Hmm. to get a response from you and yeah. Tom Peterson at the time uh -huh. and uh, coming up for an interview. And, uh, <coughs> and we hired you then. To, and what <coughs> sort of, I'm a little hazy on what you're, the first things you did for us. I remember, <coughs> uh, I think when I did the interview, uh, <coughs> you told me that I would be doing perhaps some weekend sports and some radio and television reporting. Uh -huh. But as it turned out, the week uh, that I got hired, I believe Pam Hildebrand at the time, who had been doing the noon weather, mm -hmm. had just left doing the noon weather. Okay. Or she wanted to get off the noon weather. So actually, the first one of the first things I was hired for was to do the noon you weather. Did the weather then. <laughs> and then along with the reporting. Uh huh which was fun. I loved doing the weather. It uh, was a chance to be able yeah, to Yeah, I remember it. that now, right. So <coughs> I did that for a little while, <coughs> and eventually wound up doing everything there. Yeah, but uh, you were, again, a very adaptable with a set of skills and mm -hmm. good at a lot of things. Uh, <coughs> but we, uh, so you were doing a lot of uh, straight ahead reporting. Right, when I started out, exactly. Right, of doing uh, the breaking stories. Yep. Uh, Maybe some, I don't know if you did some beat work. You yeah, I, I'm not sure I had a beat, but I remember covering some trials mm -hmm. and uh, you're right, the day-to-day -day news. The day-to-day uh, -day news. News kind of <laughs> thing while uh, kind of around the noon weather. When I was done doing the noon weather, yeah. then I'd be sent out to cover some of the daily news. And I got a feeling that we began to sense something about the Gary <laughs> Sarnoff, the television personality uh, doing the weather and about mm -hmm. your ability with words. <coughs> 
Uh, so did that somehow evolve into the close-up specialty? As, as I remember, I think it did. I, hmm. I did uh, uh, some of the weather where I was able to have a little fun doing the weather, hmm. and you're right, play with the words, and I also did some weekend sports once in a while. Hmm. You were notorious for puns. Oh, right? oh yes, I, exactly. <laughs> yes, I, notorious is a good word for it. <laughs> I subjected our viewers and co-workers to many puns all the time. <laughs> and. Uh, I think we eventually found a niche where I'd do some stories that had human interest to them. We didn't really put a name on it, yeah. but I think after I did a couple of those stories, we realized that maybe we ought to like franchise this. Yeah. Maybe we ought to try to make this a put regular a showcase on exactly, it. Exactly, showcase mm -hmm. it. And I remember us, uh, you and I, having conversation. What should we call this? Mm -hmm. And there already was like a Iowa Traveler, I think, yeah. or something like that. But yeah. we wanted to put a franchise, put a put a name on it, and wound up with. I think it started out with Eastern Iowa close up. Mm -hmm. And then we said, why limit it to Eastern Iowa? And turned it into Iowa close-ups. Hmm. They were the human, the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, Charles Corral stories. Exactly. That's right. who I, you know, obviously I, <coughs> I wish I could be Charles Corral. Well, but, uh, but Charles Corral's magic was writing and, yeah. and, and writing, to, writing to video. <coughs> exactly. Right. And with me, I think it was just try to let my personality come through right. with my writing and my presentation. And the find a part of the job was just finding these stories. Yeah. You know they're out there. Yeah. You know that everybody knows there are those people who you'd love to, to see on TV and do a story about. And part of it was just finding them. And then once you found those stories, you know, spend a minute and a half or so and <coughs> and showcase them. But that's the big. You know, you you ultimately you do find good stories, or, um, but once you find them, what do you do with them? Exactly. That's the that's the key, and it's. Kind of a, with me, luckily, I think after a while, my personality just kind of took over. Once I'd get there, just in the interview, yeah. you'd kind of get an idea while you're doing the interview of how the story is shaping up. Yeah. And you obviously look for the best video <coughs> opportunities, and some are so obvious that there's, it's a no-brainer. I remember doing one on Bite Livingston, this older pilot, and of yeah. course we went up for a ride with Bite, and yeah. that's all you need to do, just show him and let, let him put a mic on him. And <coughs> that's let him the do famous all. Livington's brothers from exactly. uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, exactly. <laughs> his brother, <laughs> yep. and, and uh, the early Waterloo aviators, yep. very early. Yep, I think at the, I'm not sure if it's still there at the Waterloo Airport, there's a little exhibit about the Livingston. I think it is still there. Yeah. But, right. Uh, but yeah, a lot of stories kind of almost produce themselves, and I just try not to screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very modest of you, but again, um, my sense, you're right, it was a, it's a triple combination. It was your personality, it was your ability to write, but your ability to write television stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's, that was the challenge, and that was the fun of it. It w was coming back and taking what I knew was a great interview and mm -hmm. a fun person. Not always fun. Sometimes it was like almost melodramatic, not melodramatic, mm -hmm. but uh, fairly serious. Mm -hmm. But just making the best and sometimes blending in some music, just yeah. making the best minute and a half I could. <laughs> Well, you, in our previous conversation, you, one of the stories you said you really liked was about a, uh, ladies in the hospital knitting baby caps, was that it? There was one that yeah. I've kept around for a while uh, out of Postville, Iowa. Hmm. There was a, a woman who I think was 92 years old, hmm. and she spent her spare time knitting caps for newborn babies. Hmm. And, uh, and the, the payoff was she got to meet these newborn babies. And although she w her health wasn't too good, <coughs> she'd see the newborns on the babies and get to hold the babies. Ah. And that story, I very uh, there was a little bit of me talking, not a lot of puns in this story. Mm, yeah, right. But it was pretty much letting her talk and letting her hold the babies, <coughs> and it was it was really touching. It was. Uh, oh yeah, I can. So that's that, that's worthy of a Murrow who Gary. Oh, I'm sure. <coughs> but it, it was it was a departure because a lot of my stuff was silly, and you wait for Gary's puns yeah. and wait for <coughs> Gary to act funny. But every so often, just a neat little story like right. this where you don't need puns, you don't uh, need Gary acting silly. But mm, again, those <coughs> when we m we showcase those within the major newscasts, they weren't right. uh, they weren't relegated to the five o'clock or <coughs> correct. Not that five o'clock is a relegation newscast mm -hmm. today, but to some extent right. it was then. Exactly. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> Well, the uh, the other thing that evolved, uh, this pretty well out of a couple of things, your interest in uh, 
in movies. Mm -hmm. You're kind of student of movies. Right. And uh, I suppose in some meeting that you and I had, uh, you proposed that you start doing movie reviews. I remember that because we had a franchise, I forgot his name, but we used a syndicated movie critic. Oh, that's right. At our station, and we got it off a of feed. Mm -hmm. And we used him, I don't know, for about a year or so. And I think I remember one time, because I went to so many movies, and I was kind of a student of the cinema, <laughs> and uh, read a lot of publications about movies, just went to a lot of movies. And I remember one time just coming to you and saying, I could do what he's doing, sure. but do it locally. Yeah. And so we talked and we tried again to figure out what's a way to, to make this work in a local, local market. And uh, I thought I'd the Gary Sarnoff screen test where we put a grade on it, yeah. each movie. <coughs> and what I think really helped and what really worked about it was not so much me just doing the movie reviews, which was kind of fun for me, obviously, but we eventually let the audience, would let the viewers vote. I don't know if you remember that we had That's what right. I called a viewer vote eventually, yeah. where mm -hmm. I gave it a grade, yeah. because we'd always get calls, well, that's just one person's opinion, you know. <laughs> right. And I said, well, and we opened it up to, to the, the viewers, and what they did, we had a little system where they would call in. I'd tell them what movie I was going to do <laughs> next week. When you see it, call in with your grade. Yeah. We average it out. So I'd give a movie a B plus, hmm. and then the viewer vote, what we call it, we'd average out all the other people's votes, uh, grades, and that's what the general audience thought. <laughs> so it kind of got the audience involved. Well, very much so, and very again, a lot of creative thinking in, in that, so much of which I had sort of forgotten about. And then <coughs> at the time of the Academy Awards, uh, you'd get all dressed up in your tuxedo <laughs> and oh, really, yeah. really put the dog on for that. Uh, well, I guess you'd pick the award winners, right? Right. We did a little segment <coughs> of picking the Academy Awards <coughs> where you're right at Rent a Tux. You're the only one. <laughs> Rent a Tux. And uh, sit in the same set and stuff, yeah. all dressed up as <coughs> if I was going to the Oscars. <coughs> and right, give my opinions and mm. my predictions for the Oscars, mm -hmm. and then of course the next week we come back and see how see I did, did. Mm -hmm. right, and which was fun. Mm. And, uh, and I think we regularized that to some extent, didn't we, weekly? We did, mm -hmm. yeah. So it, uh, and the screen test, we moved around a little bit. The screen test, I think, wound up being on the Friday early show, uh -huh. so that when you're planning the weekend. Yeah. And I think we had it at the Thursday, 10 o'clock for a while, but mm. it was toward the end of the week, so if you're planning sure. to do something this weekend, here's a movie. Here's the you movie review. Oh, exactly. Makes sense. Yeah, right. Well, you also wound up doing quite a bit of producing at uh, Channel 7 mm. as time went by. I did. I was kind of one of those persons that, that be, because I knew how to produce, which I'm obviously glad I did, that uh, if there, somebody was sick or if there was somebody on vacation or if somebody had left and yeah. needed somebody to fill in producing, I would help them out, mm. and although it wasn't my first love, it mm. was still, what I liked about working at Channel 7 is that I had a variety. I, I mm. didn't produce all the time. Right. I didn't do feature stories all the time or weather sports, and so producing was just part of the overall experience for me. Yeah, there. and uh, <coughs> and then, uh, but again, you were, <coughs> at that time, we were putting a fair amount of emphasis on, on producing how newscasts went together. Exactly. Uh, a lot more than in my early experience when we didn't pay much attention oh, to no, that. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. I mean, my early experience, too. Hmm. I think Lee Swanson was our first producer that I remember ever having. Because the, the anchors were doing, were, exactly. were, were anchor producers. Everybody kind of put their own things together. Yeah. You're right, the anchors produced their own mm -hmm. shows. Mm -hmm. And you're right, producing about a year, less than a year after I started, yeah. came into focus. And Swanson was one of the, he, we learned a tremendous amount from Lee. He, mm -hmm. he was very good at that. Brilliant. He was a very and still doing that. I, mm. From what I understand, mm -hmm. yeah. And he's uh, as the, one of the smartest and producers and news people I've known. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> well, a um, good experience at Channel 7, particularly in the Black Hawk days, right? It was excellent. I look back and think uh, what a great run it was. It was great people. It was, it, was, it was an exciting time because new technology was coming in all the time. I started, believe it or not, when there was film. Yep. We were just getting rid of film, switching right. to videotape. Yep. And then, of course, live capabilities started coming in. Yep. And everything was changing, it seemed, almost overnight. New technology, new capabilities. And uh, it was a fun time to be in television. It was. And you were there, <coughs> you transitioned through the first cha change of ownership, which was to the uh, folks that were known as the Duck Company, the <laughs> Affleck, uh, exactly. uh, their, their broadcast division. And they were, uh, they were very bottom line oriented, but they yep. were pretty, uh, pretty savvy people about letting the local stations run their operations. Right. 
Yeah, it was. It was still. It wasn't the family like Blackhawk Broadcasting. Yeah. It was a whole different atmosphere around right. there, obviously. But you're right. They were bottom line. I think everybody, probably every station, which the owners right. would spend more money. But no, Aflac, uh, I think, let us do what we needed to do. And the, the news department still had a very uh, Jim Waterbury, one of the best yep. managers I've, I've ever worked for, Absolutely. and I think you'd probably s say amen to that. Oh, yes. <coughs> there aren't too many Jim Waterburys around, and no, I was lucky not. to work with both you and Jim Waterbury for quite a while. Yeah, right. And uh, then, <coughs> as I retired, uh, you found yourself confronted with another change of ownership, and right. not to get into all the bloody details <laughs> of that, but... Uh, that I would uh, think was not as positive an experience. No, and it was, I guess, a matter of time. I had been there 25 years, yeah. and you know, I had heard stories about changes of ownership and <laughs> people leaving and that kind of thing. And so when uh, Ray Comp came aboard, uh, I think, and I understand why. I think they looked at, at probably at some books hmm. and looked at some people who weren't essential for the station, hmm. and that were had been there a while and earning some money, and decided here's a way to save us some money. Let's just get rid of. This let's, person. let's take the latter part <laughs> of that <laughs> sentence and make it bold. <laughs> right, I mean, uh, you, what you were, you know, and what they didn't understand was the value of what the Sarnoff uh, contribution to that mix that was for, of success mm -hmm. that Black Hawk and uh, Affleck had achieved uh, was. Mm. Yeah, and, and they were, and I guess they weren't here, you know, and I, as an accountant, I imagine somebody that's crunching numbers. Bean counters, of course. Exactly. Bean counters are looking at this and looking maybe at the salary, yeah. looking at how long this person's been there, looking at what he does at the station. Well, he's not an anchor. He does in, he's not a sports anchor. He's you not know, the news director. Hmm. And wh why do we need This is a way we can save some money. <laughs> and you maybe. see, I will say that Waterbury and I were smart enough to know what what you were worth. That's why you stayed there as long as you did. And I appreciated that. Right. <coughs> yeah. uh, well, I'm not saying Waterbury was smart, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. But mm, it's sort of the story of the 90s, and uh, and a mm -hmm. lot of things have happened during the 90s. But but it turned out to be a fortuitous. Uh, maybe said, hey, it's time for Gary to move on, and you and move on. You did from this Waterloo market to Phoenix, Arizona. By this time in the teens in market standing. Exactly. With the skills that you took out of the what you had been doing at Channel 7, you get you you, you hire on in in one of the biggest television operations in the country. Right. So it all works out. You know, it's uh hmm. and it, with my folks out there, it's it's good for me to be in Phoenix. It was a good right lifetime now. change for Exactly. That's right. a good way to put it that hmm. it was the right thing to do at the right time. Yeah. Obviously would have liked under different circumstances. Of course. Uh, but you know, sometimes you just got to go with what you've got, and uh, this, these were the cards I was dealt, and luckily uh, it turned out well for me. Well, it did, and uh, it's an absolute joy to have had you here today, not only for the fellowship we've had at this reunion, but uh, to have this opportunity to do this interview with you. So uh, thank you very much. Gary. My pleasure. Great to be here. Great yeah. to see you again. Right back at you. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Out here.